for the longest time, those of us who have moved to the West have had the pioneer spirit of moving in, putting out vast amounts of turf, trying to recreate Kentucky and Tennessee and things that thrive on the East Coast. And that's not going to work anymore. Over the last decade, Las Vegas has been one of the country's fastest growing cities. But despite misleading appearances, the city is facing a water shortage that some are calling the worst in the region's history. And officials are struggling to find ways to get people to conserve this rapidly dwindling resource. Surprisingly, it's not the casinos who are the biggest users of water. Watering your lawn alone is probably around 60% of our water use. So for us, the time has come, and this community is embracing it, to change the way we landscape around our homes and our businesses, and how we very thoughtfully use grass in areas where we need it. Xeriscaping is trying to not necessarily come up with a landscape that is a couple of rocks and a cactus, but it's, it's designing with the idea in mind that we're trying to use less water but have the same amount of impact as some of the more traditional landscapes. There's ways to get shade, there's ways to have a lush looking garden and take half or even a third of the water that some of these other landscapes will take. I'd say about 75 to maybe 80 percent of my landscapes are a lot more water savvy than they used to be. We first went after new development and said you can no longer put grass in the front yard. You can only have 50% of the backyard be grass landscaped. In order, however, to allow our existing residents to make the conversion, we began to pay our customers a dollar per square foot to take grass out. We've, we caught everybody for whom a dollar per square foot where it penciled out. We have now said, all right, for the first 1,500 square feet, we will pay two dollars per square foot. Around 25,000 people have taken us up on the offer and we have spent over 80 million dollars taking turf out in southern Nevada. We're saving what over 20 billion gallons a year in water now as a result of it. We've added some other colors that this year we put in some more lantanas with stuff that didn't survive the cold. I'm Tom Portali, my wife Pat Portali and we live in Las Vegas in Topaz Ridge and when we first moved in, we had uh, almost 3,000 foot of grass out in the front. And our first water bill came in. It was about $165 just to water the grass. Uh, with that, we decided that the grass had to go. Looking to save, how to save water. Here in the desert, uh, it's on my mind all the time. As part of their campaign, the Water Authority has also produced a series of humorous commercials to get people to turn on their water clocks to conserve water. Can I help you? Oh! Oh! <laughs> to find your watering schedule, go to changeyourclock.com. You don't have to have cactus to be you know, drought tolerant or drought savvy. Uh, a lot of the grasses, a lot of different plants. You don't need agaves or cactus just to, just to have a water thrifty landscape. There's a lot of other options out there. We live in the desert, Lake Mead's down by, you know, 100 feet plus. I mean, we're at uh, two thirds of what the lake used to be and we don't know if we're gonna get the rain in the next five, 10 years to actually fill it back up again. Um, I think it honestly needs to hit people where it hurts. So this is the front entrance to the project. You'll see things like the elementary school and the parks. Vegas in 2000 was the poster child for how not to develop in the desert. You know, the ways that we develop sensitively towards water use in particular is that we've completely changed the, the way that we landscape our projects. For instance, we've completely eliminated turf um, use except in usable areas of parks, for instance, ball fields and things like that. And then instead of using subtropical plants, um, use the plants that thrive in the desert on minimal water. The holdouts are going to come slowly but surely. The holdouts will be continuing to pay more and more and more for the luxury of having that grass. The culture change we're embarking on here is the same culture change that has to happen in Arizona, in California, and in all the western states. 
we're just leading the way because we're a little bit more on the edge than they are, you're going to see a very different West in 50 years. One where people who are moving to the West understand what it means to live in the desert. They find the desert beautiful. They have come to appreciate the landscaping. They love the climate. You wouldn't move to Alaska if you don't like the cold. Well, don't move to the desert if you don't enjoy the landscaping that flourishes and is here naturally. After five years of severe drought, weeks of rolling rainstorms have soaked California, causing flooding in many parts of the state and finally replenishing surface water supplies. But in much of the Southwest, the drought continues. Lake Mead, one of the most critical water sources in the country, is at dangerously low levels, and federal employees are struggling to manage the depleted reserves. This box that we're looking at right here, this is where we do our tape drop to measure the elevation of Lake Mead. It's a wire weight gauge, so we have the heavy weight on a wire, and as we lower the weight down, it goes from a certain amount down to zero, and that'll tell us how far that weight went down. Tell me a little bit about the water level situation that, that you know, you're facing right now. Years ago, of course, the lake was way up. There was a time in 1983 when I could look down over this wall and it was within six or eight feet. However, over the years with the drought, you can see what's happened. We've gone down an enormous amount in that time. Joe Donnelly works for the Bureau of Reclamation, which is the federal agency tasked with managing the water in Lake Mead the largest reservoir in the United States. The lake has been held in place by the Hoover Dam since the 1930s, and many homes, farms, and businesses in the Southwest depend on its water to survive. But that may be in jeopardy. Thanks to a years-long drought, Lake Mead has gone from 98% full two decades ago to only 38% full today, dropping nearly 130 feet in the process. If it gets any lower, the Bureau of Reclamation will have to declare a shortage and start rationing. So what happens if the government declares a shortage? The short answer? Things will get complicated. Seven states in Mexico draw water from the Colorado River Basin in complex agreements determine how much they can take. The Bureau of Reclamation facilitates these negotiations. The Lower Colorado River is uniquely managed like no other river in the United States. This is a, not only the most scrutinized river, but it's also the one that's been most fought over over the last hundred years. In 1968, Congress approved the Central Arizona Project, which allowed the state to siphon off water from the Colorado River for its cities and farms to the south. As part of this deal, California got what's called senior water rights, meaning that even if a shortage is announced today, they wouldn't have to cut back. Arizona, on the other hand, would have to reduce consumption by 11 percent, or 114 billion gallons. What's the current situation right now with the way the different states and municipalities are interacting with each other? There's still old scars there, but they're at the table talking. They've come together to realize that if they don't work together, this precious resource, this system of water, not just Lake Mead, is in serious trouble. One of the people at the table is John Ensminger, general manager of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. 90% of the water Las Vegas relies on for everyday use comes directly from Lake Mead. We're always negotiating. The seven states that share the Colorado River are basically always at the negotiating table, figuring out how to continue to adapt to changing circumstances. You mentioned that the seven states that get their water from the Colorado River need to cooperate. Um, if, if they didn't, hypothetically, what does that mean? Well, I think you could see litigation. I think really what the result of not cooperating would ultimately be, would ins instead of having water professionals sort these problems out and, and make the, the best case they can for how to operate, you'd be turning things over likely to federal judges to pick winners and losers. But there's more at stake than just court cases. According to the Bureau of Reclamation, the river supports 16 million jobs, generates $1.4 trillion in economic benefits, and irrigates nearly 6 million acres of farmland. 
Do you ever anticipate that if things get really bad here, that there could be what some people might call water wars? Well, we like to say cooperation instead of litigation. But if you have farmers in Arizona that are upset about having to use less water and farmers in California get to use the same amount of water, doesn't that then create a conflict? Possibly could create a conflict, and conflicts are solved by going to court. And if you go to court, that takes time, and that's not going to help the river. The Bureau of Reclamation hopes that states will continue to work together to allocate water. But with future projections indicating a possible shortage in the years to come, it remains to be seen how long this cooperation will last. State water officials today rejected portions of a plan to tap billions of gallons of rural groundwater. Thanks for joining us tonight at 6. I'm Christiane Klein. And I'm Brian Loftus. Twice before, the state engineer had sided with the Las Vegas Water Agency's plan to build a 300-mile-long series of pipelines and pumps to bring water from rural Nevada to the Las Vegas Valley. Does this mean the so-called water grab is dead? Well, George Knapp of the I-Team has followed this water fight for years and is here with the latest, George. This is actually the fourth time the state engineer has ruled on applications to tap into rural water basins, but it's the first time that office has said no. The Las Vegas Valley Water District filed applications back in 1989 to siphon off billions of gallons of groundwater from four valleys in central eastern Nevada. The plan was to spend about $15 billion on 300 miles of pumps and pipelines to bring a river of groundwater to Las Vegas. Opponents, including ranchers, Native Americans, and environmentalists, have long argued that the plan would suck rural Nevada dry, create a vast dead zone, kill plants, animals, and communities. Each time the state engineer has ruled in favor of the plan, opponents have gone to court to have the decision overturned. Today, the state engineer issued a 111-page decision, which announced for the first time that it has rejected the Las Vegas request to take water from those four valleys. They made it clear the decision was because of recent court orders, and the state plans to appeal parts of what the court has ordered. Las Vegas Valley water officials say they also plan to go to court. In a statement, the Water District said the ruling makes it clear there is water available in these basins and it will go to court to make sure the process moves forward. The state decision raised big questions about whether rural basins would be able to recharge after losing such large amounts of water. Although the water grab plan has been on the back burner in the last few years, Water District officials say they need to keep it open as an option for the future. The district has already spent more than $100 million associated with this plan.
There were many in the 1800s who wouldn't have been surprised at scenes of barbarism on America's frontiers. This was thought to be quite literally a new world with all the wanton recklessness or utopian promise of youth. Some were sure that the boundless wilderness would cause inevitable degeneration. Civilization would lapse into barbarism here. Yet others felt that the new world offered one last chance to build society anew, free of the tyranny, poverty, and injustice that plagued the old. No doubt the Mormons harbored such fears and hopes for their own new land as the river ice began to break and new grasses pushed through the sod of western prairies that spring of 1847. Perhaps eight or 9,000 of them occupied hastily thrown up log cabins on both sides of the Missouri near present-day Omaha. On the Nebraska side was winter quarters. On the Iowa side, Canesville. Some had wintered in towns downriver, St. Louis or St. Joseph. Many remained in Nauvoo or in major East Coast cities. Several thousand were in England awaiting word as to where the camp of Israel would settle so they might join them. Several hundred miles west of winter quarters near Pueblo, Colorado, Mormon converts from Mississippi and sick detachments from the Mormon battalion made up a community of nearly 300. Still further west, the remainder of the battalion, 350 strong, had reached San Diego and Los Angeles. Sam Brannan's group was in Northern California. This party of 238 had sailed round the Horn the previous year in the ship Brooklyn. A few others had come to California with earlier overland migrations. Thus, tens of thousands were responding to Apostle Orson Pratt's earlier clarion call. We do not want one saint to be left in the United States. Let every branch in the east, west, north and the south be determined to flee out of Babylon, either by land or by sea. All that winter they made preparations for the pioneer journey. In January, Brigham Young announced that they would travel in groups of 10, 50, and 100 wagons with a captain presiding over each group. He urged the companies to divide the poor among them so that no one group would bear an undue burden. He encouraged his followers with a revelation in which divine assurance was given that they would be led by that God who led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And his arm is stretched out in the last days to save his people Israel. But in their typically practical fashion, the Mormons didn't rely upon God's arm alone. They gathered together all of the scientific instruments they could find, sextants, barometers, thermometers, and telescopes. They consulted travelers visiting their camp from the West, including the Catholic missionary Father De Smit. They prepared maps of the West based on this one published by John C. Fremont in 1845. Seeds, plows, saws, and other equipment essential to new settlement were gathered. They carried with them a large leather boat equipped with nets and other fishing gear. They took pains to assure the participation of men skilled in a variety of needed crafts and trades. They even conducted lectures on the methods of irrigation should they find the rainfall insufficient for raising crops. Thus prepared, a select pioneer company, 148 strong, began in early April to gather a short distance west of winter quarters. This was a crack team, mainly tried and experienced men, commissioned to mark the trail, choose a settlement site, and begin construction of shelters for companies to follow. On April 16th, they began their journey in earnest. Brigham Young presided over the expedition, overseeing every detail. Under his rule, a bugle sounded at five o'clock in the morning. The whole company was to breakfast, harness their teams, and be prepared for travel by seven. They were to be on the road until 8.30 in the evening and be ready for bed by nine. Young offered continuous advice and occasional reprimands when evening and Sunday recreation became too rowdy. It was a bracing regimen that paid off in rapid travel. A makeshift odometer, somewhat like this one, automatically ticked off the revolutions of a wagon wheel as they moved up the valley of the Platte. By its measurements, 15 to 20 mile days were not uncommon. In 39 travel days, the company arrived at Fort Laramie, 
averaging 14 miles a day for the 600-mile leg of the journey. To avoid possible conflicts, they had established the Mormon Trail on the north side of the river, away from the main road on the south side. This first half of their journey had been easy going. The mountains and deserts of the second half would be a greater challenge. After crossing near Fort Laramie to the south side of the Platte, the company paused to shoe animals, repair wagons, and freshen up for the next leg of their journey. Here they met an advanced contingent of Mississippi and ailing Mormon battalion saints. From them they learned that an enormous Oregon-bound migration of at least 2,000 wagons was behind them on the trail. From this point, they were back on the regular immigrant road, following the Platte to its crossing near the mouth of the Sweetwater. After Fort Laramie, a crew was assigned to prepare and plant markers each 10 miles along the way. Others were to gather food for the expedition. Young sharply rebuked the hunters on at least one occasion for being wasteful of flesh, killing more than was really needed. At the last crossing of the Platte, before striking the Sweetwater, they unloaded their leather boat. They used it to ferry themselves and other westward-bound immigrants across the swollen waters. Ever pressed for hard cash, they were delighted to learn that the Oregon-bound immigrants were willing to pay $1.50 to $2 a wagon for the ferry service. A crew was given the task of building a raft that could carry a loaded wagon across the river. Ten men under Thomas Grover were left at the ferry to man the operation. They then climbed up over South Pass. Along the Big and Little Sandy Rivers, they ran into several parties of travelers, including mountain men Moses Harris, Miles Goodyear, and Jim Bridger. Bridger recommended the Utah Valley as a settlement site, Harris Cache Valley. Both had doubts about the enterprise, though Miles Goodyear was much more optimistic. Harris thought that there wouldn't be enough timber. Bridger feared that the growing season would be too short. But apparently the overall communication to the Pioneer Company was positive. It may have been these discussions which led Brigham Young finally to decide that the Mormons should settle in the vicinity of the Great Salt Lake. The only dissenting voice came from a fellow saint, Samuel Brannan. Brannan, with but two companions, had made a daring spring crossing of the Sierras, noting the grim remains of the Donner tragedy as they passed. He then hurried up the Humboldt, north to Fort Hall, and east to the Green, where he met Brigham Young's Pioneer Company in late June. Brannan had already set up a press in California, bringing with him 16 issues of his California Star. He also brought the news that California had been occupied by the United States and would most certainly become a U.S. possession. His settlement on the San Joaquin River had been established, and the saints there were making plans to receive the main companies when they arrived. Come on to California, he urged, where the climate is mild, the soil proven fertile, and where thousands of acres of well-watered land can be had for the taking. Young pondered Brannon's enthusiastic advice. California, even then, was a magic word stirring up images of physical comfort, of bounteous nature, and the good life. Vast tracts of that rich land could fall under Mormon control if Brigham Young would only give the word. But such a land would surely attract thousands from the states, inundating the Mormons in a flood of new settlers. It may well be that at that moment the fate of the Mormon movement hung in the balance. Apparently, without further discussion, Young rejected Brannon's advice. The company, now joined by the lead parties of the Pueblo Battalion Group, moved on to Fort Bridger. The fort, Orson Pratt wrote with obvious disappointment, consists of two adjoining log houses, dirt roofs, and a small picket yard of logs set in the ground. From there, they left the Oregon Trail, continuing on over Hastings Cutoff, on a route the Pratt wrote, is but dimly seen, as only a few wagons passed over it last season. As they moved down Echo Canyon, the company spread out along the trail, partly due to an outbreak of an unknown disease they called mountain fever, maybe a variant of Rocky Mountain spotted fever that's carried by wood ticks. After emerging from the canyon, a scouting party under Orson Pratt considered the Weber Canyon route to the valleys, which had been used by most of the 1846 parties. However, a five-mile ride down the canyon convinced him that they should return and search for the Donna Reed tracks. They shortly found them, partially overgrown with grass, and began to improve the road their predecessors of the previous season had blazed. 
Continuing to work the road as they moved, Pratt's party gained glimpses of the Salt Lake Valley from the top of Big Mountain on July 19th. On the 21st, he and Erastus Snow descended Emigration Canyon, climbed over Donner Hill, and gazed in awe upon the panorama spread out below them. Beholding in a moment such an extensive scenery open before us, we could not refrain from a shout of joy, which almost involuntarily escaped from our lips the moment this grand and lovely scenery was within our view. After a brief exploration, the men returned to their camp. The next day, July 22nd, Pratt guided the first wagons to the mouth of Emigration Canyon, where they worked four hours clearing a path to avoid the steep hill the Donner Party had taken. They then rolled into the Salt Lake Valley and camped in the vicinity of 5th East and 19th South. The next morning, they moved north to about 4th South and Main, about where the Center Theater was built, and began plowing. That evening, Pratt dedicated the land as a home for the saints. Two days later, the last wagons pulled out of Emigration Canyon. Brigham Young, recovering from a severe bout with Rocky Mountain fever, had his driver stop the carriage. He gazed upon the scene. As he did so, he recalled later, That darkness which had rested over every place where we'd been in the States vanished altogether. And I felt assured that our enemies would never accomplish anything more towards our destruction than what they had accomplished. Wilford Woodruff later remembered that Young was wrapped in vision for a few moments, then said, it is enough. This is the right place. Drive on. In his diary entry that day, however, Young wrote only the following. I started early this morning, and after crossing Immigration Canyon Creek 18 times, emerged from the canyon and camped with the main body at 2 p.m. About noon, the five-acre potato patch was plowed. Then the brethren commenced planting their seed potatoes. At five, a light shower accompanied by thunder and a stiff breeze. They had accomplished the journey with little privation and no loss of life. The real suffering had been at winter quarters. Having found a suitable place to settle, this advance company began immediately a communal effort to prepare for those behind them on the trail. July 25th was a Sunday, and so, of course, was devoted to sermons and speeches. But during the rest of the week, crews were assigned to carry out the various necessary immediate tasks. Plowing and planting was continued. Young appointed surveyors, fence builders, and sawyers. They built a bowery to provide shelter when public meetings were held. One crew was assigned on July 27th to search the canyons of the Wasatch Mountains for timber. Another crew explored westward to the Ochres. Brigham Young led a party northward. After noting the warm springs at the northern end of the Salt Lake Valley, Young's party decided to climb the foothills so they might gain a better view of the landscape. They headed for a peculiarly rounded knob which stood out clearly from the rest. From its summit, they could see the Jordan River from its narrows near point of the mountain to where it emptied into the lake. They also noted the courses of several other streams which crossed the valley from the east to flow into the Jordan. Completing their bird's eye survey, one of the party commented that this would be an ideal place to raise a flag or ensign. Brigham Young agreed and noted in his diary that night, I ascended a hill north of the city site, which I named Enzyme Peak. 
they had no flag with them on their hike that day, and had they raised one, I doubt very much that it would have been the Stars and Stripes. The fact is that the Mormons were in a very resentful mood about their treatment at the hands of government officials. At the moment, they felt no great loyalty to the United States. The flag they might have raised, had they had one, would probably have looked very much like this. This was a banner that church leaders ordered to be made representing the flags of all nations. Mormons believed it fulfilled an Isaiah prophecy that in the last days an ensign or flag would be raised up that would transcend national loyalties and attract all peoples. It was to be, in fact, the flag of the Mormon kingdom of God. Ensign Peak thus became a symbol of international outreach. It's now obscured from much of the downtown area by a condominium complex. However, the widespread wish to be separated from the United States had a broader and more positive dimension. Two weeks after the Pioneer Company entered the Salt Lake Valley, Brigham Young ordered that a dam be built across one of the creeks to form a pool. He then was immersed in a ritual rebaptism. Each of the apostles present then followed, and then most of the rest of the company. It was a solemn but joyous occasion. Erastus Snow wrote of it, we had as it were, entered a new land and wished to renew our covenants and commence a newness of life. The use of the word new three times in that short context was profoundly significant. For rebaptism represented on that occasion much more than just a call to repentance. It was, as Snow clearly stated, a recognition that in a new land, it may be possible to begin society anew, to reshape society rooting out all that is unjust and undesirable in the old. From the earliest settlement, the thought of a new land, of a new world, had awakened the reformist impulse in man. And this wish to build a better world made the isolation of the Great Basin, which others had feared, a great attraction to the Mormons. Whereas the doughty Swiss immigrant Heinrich Lienhardt would gladly have stayed here in 1846 had there been earlier settlers, the Mormons gladly stayed in 1847 because there were no earlier settlers. They were as many travel days away from the nearest established settlement as were the pilgrims from London in the 1600s. And in their present mood, they wanted nothing so much as to be left alone. Not even the streams and rivers here mingled with those on the outside, which suited the Mormons just fine. But they were soon to find that isolation a mixed blessing. While it was no doubt comforting that there were none here to hurt or make afraid, as their hymn expressed it, there were likewise none to assist or supply in case of need. Previous pioneering in remote frontiers had often been attended by terrible privation and loss of life. There inevitably followed a long, costly period of dependency on the mother society. This land was unknown and her soils untried. No one knew for sure whether large numbers could survive here. There were, however, positive factors favoring the Mormon enterprise. Visitors from the time of the Dominguez Escalante expedition had considered the bench and valley lands excellent for grazing. Fremont agreed, suggesting that wheat and other grains could be raised there as well. Late in 1846, Miles Goodyear had established a trading post, or at least a cabin, on the site of present-day Ogden. By summer, he had corn and other vegetable crops well underway. Of all the mountain men the Mormons had met on the trail, he was the most positive, though there may have been some self-interest in his assessment. The migration he had hoped to serve from his base at the mouth of the Weber River obviously wasn't going to materialize as he had planned. The Mormons themselves were for the most part favorably impressed by the new home site, though their trek across western Wyoming would likely have made the most withered of grasses look lush. Woodruff called the Salt Lake region a vast, rich, fertile valley, clothed with the heaviest garb of green, abounding with the best freshwater springs, riverlets, creeks, brooks, and rivers of varied sizes. Orson Pratt noticed, however, the grass had nearly dried up for want of moisture. The drier places were swarming with very large crickets, about the size of a man's thumb. Nonetheless, Pratt and others were pleased with the site, if less enthusiastic than Woodruff. 
Time would show that irrigation was vital to successful agriculture in the Great Basin. In this respect, the Mormon choice for an initial settlement site was extremely fortunate. The Salt Lake Valley was crossed from east to west by seven small streams which were fed most of the summer by snows melting from the Wasatch Mountains. A small brush diversion dam would in most instances be sufficient to feed a canal the two or three miles needed before lands could be irrigated from the next stream. This was of vital importance as the Mormons had almost no capital and needed to put land into immediate production. There were few places in the arid west where this could be done as expeditiously as in the Salt Lake Valley. They were fortunate for another reason as well. Many areas of the Great Basin were the regular habitat of Indians. There were northern Shoshone to the north, Goshutes and western Shoshone to the west, Utes to the south, and Paiutes to the southwest. The Great Salt Lake Valley, however, had for some time been a sort of buffer zone between the various tribes. There were no Indian villages near the initial settlement site, and the Mormons were not yet encroaching on territorial claims of any particular group. When they looked beyond the Salt Lake Valley, however, they intruded upon established territory in almost any direction. Their good fortune was that the full implications of their settlement in the Great Basin didn't occur to the native leaders until the Mormons were present in numbers sufficient to withstand Indian resistance. The final favorable circumstance came from their own group character and their experiences as a people over the previous 17 years. Had each gone out to settle his own farm or gone prospecting or had many been enticed by California, the Mormon story would have been greatly altered. But the saints by this time were instinctively obedient to those they saw as their legitimate authorities. Oh, sure, they grumbled and some dissented, but most eventually moved in directions urged by their leaders. It would have made more sense, been more rational from one point of view, had they set about immediately building their own homes for their wives and families, rather than helping to build a community bowery or plowing in a common field. But to do so would have been repugnant to Mormon notions of authority, unity, and order. Thus, the principles which were to shape Mormon use of this land were worlds away from the more highly individualistic approach common to other Western settlements. Brigham Young enunciated the basic philosophy of Mormon settlement in the Great Basin in his sermon on July the 25th. No man should buy or sell land. Every man should have his land measured off to him for city and farming purposes, what he could till. He might till it as he pleased, but he should be industrious and take care of it. There should be no private ownership of streams, wood, or timber, and only dead timber should be used as fuel. Working under these rules, they put a whipsaw into operation, set up a blacksmith shop, built a boat, hewed out a canyon road, and established an adobe yard. They laid out the city in 10-acre blocks, constructed a fort with adobe walls on three sides, and harvested salt from the lake. By December 7th, they had planted 2,000 acres of fall wheat. Certainly, they had work aplenty to do. Hard on the heels of the Pioneer Company were the sick detachments of the battalion and the Mississippi Saints. Behind them were four more companies of immigrants numbering 1,500 souls. Before winter set in, the first of the discharged battalion members would arrive from California. With the initial labors well underway, Brigham Young turned the reins of government over to a high council of 12 men under Joseph Smith's uncle, John Smith. He then returned with a substantial company to winter quarters. From there, letters would be sent to the scattered saints throughout the world, proclaiming that a settlement place had been found. The saints were urged to come at the first opportunity to the valley, as it was already being called. In 1847, this was still a raw, unsettled wilderness. But Latter-day Israel was soon to be gathered to this newfound land. Here, they would throw their collective energies into the task of building up the Mormon Zion.